Eric Beard back again. We're discussing the integrated training approach via the National Academy of Sports Medicine and their optimum performance training model. We discussed the three levels of the OPT model. We touched on the five different phases, and now we're going to elaborate on the seven components of a workout. The first component that's identified within a workout is the warm-up. And during the warm-up, we're addressing flexibility first. NASM uses a three-tiered approach to flexibility that matches the optimum performance training model. There are three levels of flexibility. The bottom level of flexibility is corrective flexibility. NASM recommends using two separate tools during this type of flexibility training. The first is self myofascial release, the second is static stretching. The goal here is to reduce muscular imbalances and restore muscular length. This is the best type of flexibility training for most beginners out there who have been sedentary or for a high level athlete or a, high, um, a very active recreational user that has muscular imbalances. We're using self myofascial release to inhibit overactive muscles perhaps restore some health to the fascial system, and we're using static stretching to restore length. We're only using static stretching on muscles that we've identified to be short on, after the assessment process. We're not doing static stretching before workout on a muscle that could be neutral length or long. We don't want to make a muscle longer than it's supposed to be. The next level of flexibility training is active. During active flexibility, there are two techniques that we're going to recommend. First is self myofascial release to continue to work with those adhesions or overactive muscles that we might have through our recreational activity or a seated job. And then we're going to perform active isolated stretching. Active isolated stretching is now going to start to use uh, the concept of reciprocal inhibition using the opposite muscle. Static stretching focuses on using autogenic inhibition. But active isolated stretching uses the concept of reciprocal inhibition, one muscle to inhibit its opposite muscle. It's going to start to give us a little bit of neuromuscular control and strength through a range of motion. This is going to be for an individual who has minimal muscular imbalances and has some level of experience through a health and fitness program. The next tier of flexibility is going to be functional. This is more along the lines of someone who has minimal muscular imbalances and has a training history under them. We typically think of athletes performing this type of workout, but it can just be someone who's performed exercises for a while and has minimal levels of imbalances. Two techniques are recommended here, self myofascial release and then dynamic stretching, which is just using body weight in a multiplanar approach in a rhythmic motion. We're starting to work with addressing the multiplanar, the multiplanar movement that we need as human beings. We don't just move in the sagittal plane and the frontal plane or the transverse plane. We must develop extensibility of our tissues and control of those tissues in the entire kinetic chain or human movement system in all three planes of motion. Based off of someone's assessment or the phase of training that they're in the LPT model, we're going to select the appropriate flexibility to go along with that flexibility training. When it comes to the cool down, we'll kind of jump down so we address the warm up. Now we'll go to the cool down. During the cool down we always recommend the corrective flexibility approach. We would have perhaps a low to moderate cardiorespiratory program, you know, three to five minutes, five to ten minutes of low to moderate intensity just to start to bring the body back to homeostasis and then we would do self myofascial release and static stretching. You could select muscles that were used during that workout or muscles that we've deemed to be overactive or short based on someone's assessment process. So we always use corrective flexibility for the cool down and the pre-workout flexibility that's performed during the warm up based on someone's assessment process and where they are in the OPT model. Cardiorespiratory activity can be performed as part of the warm up as well. We're not necessarily going to do cardio before the flexibility. When you start to look at someone doing a cardio warm up for three to five or five to ten minutes, there's not going to be a significant impact on tissue extensibility. Now, if you were going to go sit in a hot tub for ten minutes or use heat packs or even ice and then try to perform flexibility techniques, you would see those tissues improve their extensibility. But the low to moderate cardio on a treadmill in research study has shown not to be all that effective. So if someone chooses to have a cardiorespiratory warm up, we do it after the flexibility training. There are many benefits to that. When we're talking about cardiorespiratory training, we want to match that to someone's goal. Someone's trying to improve their health, lose weight, or have specific athletic performance, that we're going to match up their cardiorespiratory uh, assessment to where it is that they want to go. The basic concepts of the FIT principle, F-I-T-T-E, are used. F stands for frequency, I is intensity, T is time, T is type, and then E for enjoyment. So for frequency, the number of days per week that someone's going to be performing cardiorespiratory activity. Intensity, when we're talking about cardio, is the percentage of someone's maximal heart rate that they'll be training at. 
time, their duration of the program that they're going to be completing on a particular session, type, sometimes this is called mode, treadmill, bicycle, uh, training rope, jogging, burpees, jump rope, whatever it may be that you're using. And then E for enjoyment. Hopefully someone finds something that they like to do or at least that they don't hate. It can help with compliance. So when we're building a cardio program, start off on an assessment, build a program for them. NASM uses a three-tiered approach, much like the OPT model to training. There are three stages, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Based on someone's cardiorespiratory performance, we'll gauge where they're going to go. Stage one is going to have someone train in heart rate training zone one. This is for someone who's going to be developing a base typically a beginner, or if someone's more of an advanced user, this is going to be a recovery phase for them. If someone's in stage two, they'll be incorporating heart rate training zone one, as well as heart rate training zone two. This is going to be an introduction into interval training. And not only are we starting to develop um, our ability to deal with lactic acid, we'll start to push the ventilatory threshold as well during some of these training sessions. When someone has built up the endurance and the efficiency within stage one and stage two, we'll enter stage three. When someone's in stage three, we'll incorporate three different training zones into their training program. This is going to allow them the option to follow a more intense interval training program. This has been shown to burn more calories over a shorter period of time and help us develop EPOC, uh, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. It will rev up our metabolism, so basically we're burning extra calories for hours after the workout. The, one of the pitfalls that we see in exercise program is beginners dive into that stage three training too early and they do not have the metabolic efficiency. They haven't developed the capillary bed density. They do not have um, the efficiency to metabolize stored fat. Their heart rate cannot accelerate, stabilize, and decelerate appropriately. It can burn out their cardiorespiratory system too early and potentially lead to overtraining. So during the warm-up, we're addressing flexibility and potentially cardiorespiratory training. If we're plugging in cardiorespiratory training for fat burning or athletic performance, we may wish to do that on a separate day from the resistance training protocol. There are many different aspects to looking into building a program. When it comes to the average individual that we're talking about to, that wants to look better, feel better, whenever they'll do their cardio is the best time to do it. It's not always about the scientific rationale for providing that, since most people don't like to do cardio. One of the things that we recommend at NASM is to utilize vertical training or circuit training to get the cardio benefits in during the resistance training portion. That way you kill two birds with one stone. So next, the video that we're going to have is going to come up is going to start to talk about core balance and maybe reactor training depending on the time that we have here today. I'm Eric Beard. Thanks for watching.